and we are back for my full season review. So it's been many years since I did a full season review of a Game of Thrones show, so if you haven't been around that long or don't remember, let me say that these are a bit different from my watch videos or episode discussions. This isn't any commentary on plot holes or lore or jokes or faithfulness to the source material or even consideration of the episodes individually. For the season review, I sit down, binge the show, and talk about the whole season and whether the stories and themes are cohesive and intelligible on their own. Now, when examining Game of Thrones, I use the basic outline of looking at the POV characters as a guide for the story threads, and then examine those storylines. For example, what's the Jaime story, or the Davos story? And that system worked remarkably well for Game of Thrones, but for House of the Dragon, we find that Fire and Blood is not divided like that, so we don't have this luxury. Nor can we use setting as a guide, as most action takes place roughly in the same place for each episode. And so what I've done instead is outline what I think the main stories are from the first episode, and then follow them throughout the season, with a few new ones being added along the way. So before I get started, I wanted to say that I think the show is very good and that Ryan Condal has done an admirable job. Despite my love of George R. Martin's writing, I do not think Fire and Blood is particularly good. Its main merit is its ambiguity and its desire for the reader to puzzle out possible outcomes of what's on page. For this reason, I always believed that the source material was unadaptable. And for the large part, the source material has not been adapted. Fire and Blood or The Rogue Prince has not really been put to screen. We didn't get the ambiguous and rivaling tales of Mushroom, Septon Eustace, and a series of maesters. We didn't get Daemon Targaryen, the hero and the villain. And we didn't get the story of Daenerys and young Griff, paralleled in an earlier time. And I'm fine with that. What we got is something that far exceeds what it's based on. Again, House of the Dragon is a pretty good show. The acting is stellar, the direction is incredible, the music fantastic, the costumes wonderful, the CGI is great, it's entertaining, it's fun to watch, and talking about it with others is perhaps the best part. That said, the show definitely has its flaws, and some may get angry that I focus too much on these flaws, but you can also look at this another way. I wouldn't examine and critique something in depth that I didn't think had value to it. So the fact that I'm going in depth about House of the Dragon here is a compliment to the series. With that out of the way, let's dig in. The opening and overarching themes. Patriarchy, prophecy, prequel. So the first scene of House of the Dragon is the Great Council of 101, and in this scene and in the later text, we get a couple overarching themes for the whole show. Clearly, this opening scene is about patriarchy, shown with Viserys unfairly getting the throne over Rhaenys, but married to this scene is our opening text with the theme of destiny. The text speaks of the coming of Daenerys. Patriarchy and destiny, and these are remarkably consistent themes throughout the show. In the beginning, Viserys only thinks about his heir and the fulfillment of prophecy through a male gaze, but the first episode ends with him making Rhaenyra his heir and privy to the prophecy and dagger. A prophecy that we know is about Daenerys, another woman, and Arya, another woman, with the dagger. In episode 3, Viserys wrestles with this decision, tempted to name his son Aegon because of other signs, but in the end he does not switch his heir. In episode 4, Rhaenyra doesn't appear to take her responsibilities seriously, not finding herself a husband and having extramarital sex, and so Viserys must remind her of her duties within a patriarchal system and her duties with regard to the prophecy and forces her to marry Laenor. Rhaenyra attempts to have a fulfilling life within the patriarchal system anyway, with Harwin in episode 6, creating tension with Alicent. The tension boils over and Rhaenyra is eventually stabbed by the dagger in episode 7, clearly paralleling the future and giving the audience a feeling that Rhaenyra is bound to the prophecy. Then in episode 8, Rhaenyra returns to her father to ask about the prophecy, wanting Viserys' support, as those who want male rule threaten her heir status, and Viserys reminds us that the prophecy is true. The prophecy is misinterpreted by Alicent and the dagger is presented to Aegon, and then in episode 10, Rhaenyra confronts Daemon about the prophecy, as it motivates her to not want an all-out bloody war because she must unite Westeros. Now, I will say that House of the Dragon is much more direct with its themes than, say, Game of Thrones. Clearly, this show is about an oppressive, sexist system. We are told right from the start, and we are beaten over the head with it quite a bit through the season. By comparison, in Game of Thrones, themes are also given to us in the opening, though it's much more subtle. 
the all-male Night's Watch faces off against the all-male White Walkers, leading to the unjust execution of Will by the male Lord of Winterfell, an execution he brings only his sons to view. The opening of Game of Thrones is also about the crappy system of patriarchy, but it's no doubt handled differently, with more ambiguity, metaphor, and parable. I'm not necessarily saying that House of the Dragon's directness is wrong or worse than early Game of Thrones. After all, most Game of Thrones viewers don't view the White Walkers as metaphorically anything other than ice zombies. While I would gander that most House of the Dragon viewers do know what the show is trying to say. And in case they miss the patriarch representing patriarchy, they will have characters like Rhaenys explaining the plot later to them. And that is worth noting. House of the Dragon is blunt. We don't necessarily have to dig too deep to figure out the message. Ramsay castrating Theon has deeper thematic purpose relating to concepts of masculinity, and parallels say Arya losing her hair and concepts of femininity, while Daemon castrating criminals is... simply Daemon being cruel. It's simpler, but it's also clearly and effectively communicated. Now I do think it's bold and risky to link the themes of House of the Dragon to Season 8 of Game of Thrones, a season many people hate thematically. Game of Thrones became the story of a woman who broke her own chains, gaining agency, began breaking the chains of others, giving them agency, who then became a murderous villain who didn't want to give people agency. The series attempts to save the theme of breaking the wheel by claiming that Bran being an elected king is somehow Daenerys' goal fulfilled, but considering it's highborn people electing other highborn people, it seemed outrageous that a former slave would accept this, and the ending fell flat. House of the Dragon, like Game of Thrones, is pushing the idea that the system, specifically the patriarchy, is horrible. However, unlike Game of Thrones, the characters aren't trying to break down or change the horrible system. Save one scene where Rhaenyra says she will create a new order, all the characters simply try to master the system, and the second theme of destiny acts as a second brutal yoke that restricts our characters. When Rhaenyra has extramarital sex, it's really because of the prophecy that she must play by the rules and marry Laenor. When Kristen Cole asks her to run off and travel the world with him, her stated desire in the first episode, it's really the prophecy that keeps Rhaenyra back. The prophecy causes Rhaenyra to beg her father for help, and even when Alicent wants to concede to Rhaenyra and become her friend again, the prophecy keeps the feud going. And then in Rhaenyra's war planning, the prophecy seems to be constraining her decisions. And so I'm not really sure what to make of the theme of destiny in the context of patriarchy. Granted, this is only the first season, but it feels like the message of the show is that the system sucks and we are all powerless victims in it, though women especially are powerless victims, and besides being trapped in this crappy system, higher powers also trap us in a parallel system of inescapable destiny. And since this is a prequel, we know that the characters will not in fact escape this horrible system. The only comfort is that maybe in 170 years, we will get Daenerys' supposed realized dream of breaking the wheel with Bran. It's all pretty grim, this is a horrible world, and it's not going away anytime soon. Of course, bad systems should be torn down, and in a hope-filled world, we are not really the products of destiny, but can actively change the world for the better if we want. But unfortunately, we don't see any of the characters in House of the Dragon try to do that. No one learns from the mistakes of the previous generation. Rhaenyra and Alicent both hated not being able to choose their mates, but both turned around and forced their children into arranged marriages. Rhaenyra hated losing her mother, but made her sons lose their father. Alicent hated that her father made her a pawn in his schemes, but then she turns around and makes Aegon a pawn in her schemes. Neither Alicent nor Rhaenyra really want to change the system, they just want to be on top of the system to fulfill prophecy and to please their daddies. What's surprising is that the only character in the story that really wants to make the world a better place is Missaria. Yes, Missaria, the sex worker, brothel owner, spymaster, is the only proactive character interested in improving the lives of others. And the only character interested in free will and forging one's own path, rejecting prophecy, is Damon, a horrible, horrible murderer. Of course, this is a prequel and the writers are bound by the source material, but it's odd that the central themes of the story, patriarchy and destiny, are two problems that the main characters will not only fail to defeat, 
but failed to even try to fight against. The friendship and feud of Alicent and Rhaenyra. There and back again. And so we are next introduced to our two leads, Rhaenyra and Alicent. And while House of the Dragon certainly has other characters and other plot lines, these two characters are the most central and their relationship is the most important. House of the Dragon is more or less a show about the princess and the queen. And our story begins with the adventurous Rhaenyra and the not-so-adventurous Alicent being best friends. The two go to see Emma Arryn, who speaks of how childbirth is in Rhaenyra's future, and Rhaenyra has no interest, wanting battle and glory instead. Rhaenyra then goes to see her father, and is upset that her father is obsessed with having a male heir, and then she has a sexually charged discussion with Damon about the prospects of the male heir as well. She and Alicent spend more time together, again discussing this possible new heir, and Alicent appears upset with Rhaenyra for not studying and not having ambition. Rhaenyra claims she doesn't care about power to an incredulous Alicent, but the fact that Rhaenyra does study appears to confirm that she does in fact have ambition. Rhaenyra rips the page of the book to a shocked Alicent. The two attend the tourney, gossiping and fawning over boys, but then Emma Arryn dies and the world changes. Rhaenyra is made heir and told of the prophecy, while Alicent is instructed by her father to comfort the king. Rhaenyra hopes her new status would lead to more responsibility, but her father feels she is still impetuous and delegates her to lesser tasks like appointing Kingsguard, and so she chooses Sir Criston. Meanwhile, Alicent continues her long seduction as instructed by her father. Rhaenyra mourns her mother and worries that if her father marries again, she will be supplanted, and is specifically told by Rhaenys that yes, that's going to happen. After Daemon steals a dragon's egg and declares himself heir, Rhaenyra boldly faces her uncle, has some more sexual tension, and states that for him to become heir, she will need to die, and so he caves and relinquishes the egg and claim. Rhaenyra is told by her father that she will not be replaced, and she comes to terms with the idea that he will remarry, but feels betrayed when Alicent is to be her father's new bride. After the time skip, the friendship is still strained, Alicent appears less than content with her new life as a mother, while Rhaenyra has no interest in motherly life and Rhaenyra still fears that she's going to be supplanted. After a misunderstanding, she runs off with Sir Criston and becomes closer to him. Alicent, though pressured into pushing issues related to switching the air, instead focuses on advising Viserys in other matters, such as letting Rhaenyra choose her husband and giving aid to Daemon in the Stepstones. Rhaenyra fails to find a new husband but grows closer to Criston, and Alicent remains unhappy with her life, the two friends appear to reconcile some, but then Rhaenyra's relationship with Daemon reaches a breaking point. For the sake of adventure, Rhaenyra sneaks out with Daemon and nearly has sex with him, though Daemon bails. And so Rhaenyra goes home and has sex with Kristen Cole instead. But Rhaenyra and Daemon were spotted, and so Alicent confronts Rhaenyra about the incident. Rhaenyra lies and says that nothing happened, and Alicent vouches for Rhaenyra's word. It is uncertain whether the vouching has any impact on Viserys, but he reveals more of the prophecy's history and reminds her of her duties. Rhaenyra protests that the system is sexist, and Viserys agrees, though that's the world they live in and the realm must stay united, and thus she must marry Laenor Velaryon, though Viserys agrees to get rid of Otto. Rhaenyra meets her new gay groom and proposes an open marriage, and then Kristen wants to run off with Rhaenyra, but she doesn't want to abandon her duties. Meanwhile, Alicent is warned by Otto that Rhaenyra will kill her children, and Alicent is then told by Laris that Rhaenyra lied. Alicent checks with Kristen Cole, who spills the beans about their sex. Alicent feels betrayed and wears a green dress to Rhaenyra's first wedding feast, a statement of war. Then there's a ten-year time skip and Rhaenyra is trying to find happiness with Harwin Strong and a new family, though Alicent is trying to unravel it by exposing Rhaenyra's infidelity and instilling in her own children the idea that Rhaenyra is a threat, as her father did to her. With the aid of Sir Criston, Harwin is goaded into a fight and sent back to Harrenhal, though the act fails to expose infidelity and Rhaenyra flees to Dragonstone. Alicent is frustrated and vents to Laris, who murders his family to allow for Otto's return. Everyone meets at Lena's funeral, where the children feud, Aemon loses an eye, Alicent reaches a breaking point, thinks that Rhaenyra is getting away with everything and attacks Luke and Rhaenyra. Rhaenyra, after sleeping with Daemon earlier, feels she needs Daemon's help, fakes the death of Laenor so she can marry Daemon. And then fast forward another six years or so and Alicent is effectively ruling the kingdom and she is given one last chance to undo Rhaenyra. Vaemond wants Driftmark and wants Alicent to rule that Luke is a bastard. Rhaenyra though asks for her father's help and the scheme is foiled when Viserys returns to the throne. After some apologies from Rhaenyra and Alicent, the women appear exhausted and finally want to reconcile. But that night Viserys dies, Alicent is confused and thinks Viserys finally switched his heir. 
Allison discovers that the small council was already planning to usurp the throne for Aegon, present Rhaenyra with bad terms, and then execute her. And so she commands Kristen and Aemon to get a hold of Aegon for leverage against Otto so better terms can be sent to Rhaenyra. Rhaenyra then discovers the usurping, suffers a miscarriage, is crowned queen, and must plan for war. However, she is not eager to recklessly jump into war. Otto arrives with terms as well as a page from the history book representing her French with Alicent. Rhaenyra continues to show restraint because of the prophecy and knows she must unite the realm, but then Luke dies. And so, it's a lot of story. Perhaps too much story. Clearly, Rhaenyra and Alicent are the most fleshed out and dynamic characters in the story, growing and changing, with their relationship going through many, many twists and turns. And on top of the dizzying amount of plot shoved into Alicent and Rhaenyra, they are also the characters with the most cooks in the kitchen driving their stories. Not only are the writers and directors very focused on them, but there are two sets of actors putting in their sometimes differing interpretations. These two sets of actors did not trade notes on their portrayals, by the way. And so over time, the characters can seem confused, rapidly changing, and often contradictory at points. Or perhaps they are layered, filled with emotion, and complicated. It depends on one's opinion. One example of this is that the younger actors for Rhaenyra and Alicent specifically said they were portraying their characters as sexually confused, perhaps in love with one another, and perhaps conflating love of friendship with romantic love. It is worth noting that Emily Carey is gay and put in some of her own personal experiences into that character. Yet this wasn't communicated to the writers or to the elder actors. One thing to also note is that the first half of the season has fewer characters than the latter half, and so Olivia Cook and Emma Darcy certainly have much less time together on screen than Emily Carey and Miley Alcock. While the younger characters have five episodes to build towards hatred, the elder actors have but three episodes to go from hatred to reconciliation, with a six-year time jump in between the second and third episodes. And I do believe that it's episodes six, seven, and eight where the breakneck speed of House of the Dragon really shows. Now, on the themes. Rhaenyra and Alicent are supposed to represent women who approach the patriarchy in different ways. This is a story of women's agency, and it's quite intentional that the girls speak of Nymeria, the warrior queen, early in the story, and the page returns at the end as a symbol of their friendship. How women wield power in the patriarchy defines their relationship. Alicent plays by the so-called rules, wielding power by guiding and controlling men behind the scenes, as she specifically tells Rhaenys, while Rhaenyra ignores the rules and does as she pleases. Again, as Alicent specifically tells us, the show is blunt. The alicent Rhaenyra dynamic is somewhat similar to the sansa Arya dynamic, with the added feelings of resentment, jealousy, and heartbreak between the characters. But as I said, we have five episodes to get to a place, but only three to get back. The journey to hatred is seeded fairly well, at least on the Alicent side. Alicent is clearly jealous of Rhaenyra. While Alicent has an unhappy life and an arranged marriage with dutiful sex, Rhaenyra experiences the joys of life, exciting consensual sex and real romance. This is most overtly shown with the juxtaposition of Rhaenyra going out on her night of fun while Alicent must stay home. But we also see it with Rhaenyra's loving family situation while Alicent fails to connect with her husband or children. Alicent also likely perceives Rhaenyra as ungrateful. Alicent was secretly avoiding discussing the heir with Viserys, was secretly pushing for Rhaenyra to choose her husband, and was secretly vouching for her honesty. While Rhaenyra was unaware of Alicent's actions, Alicent would still likely feel slighted. But of course, the big thing to drive Alicent into hatred is Rhaenyra lying after swearing on the memory of her mother. The two girls both losing their mothers is an enormous empathetic point, and Rhaenyra's lie is an affront to that. As for Rhaenyra's side in the feud, the animosity is only seeded well at first. We have the betrayal and awkwardness of having one's friend marry one's dad, but then Rhaenyra seems to get over it with no real reason to. And in these early episodes, Rhaenyra is very much worried about Alicent's son supplanting her, but oddly never holds it against Alicent. Rhaenyra is incredibly forgiving, unrealistically so, making the feud rather one-sided. The scene that is most bothersome is Alicent and Rhaenyra at the Grand Sept. Rhaenyra speaks quite accurately about how people are trying to supplant her by having her father remarry, and Alicent tells her not to worry, when she knows full well what's going on, and then they emotionally connect over how they both lost their mothers. One can argue about how much Alicent was scheming or not in this scene, but a 15-year-old should not be taking it this well. 
Alicent shows enormous dishonesty with a connection to their mothers, and Rhaenyra lets it go. Meanwhile, Rhaenyra shows dishonesty with a connection to their mothers, and Alicent goes ballistic. I really don't understand how the characters reconciled in episode 4. And likewise, I do not understand how the characters reconciled in episode 8. After years and years of fighting, the loss of Aemon's eye, the suspicion on both sides that they are murderers, Alicent with Harwin, Rhaenyra with Laenor, the scheme to declare Jace and Luke bastards, Rhaenyra and Alicent suddenly apologize to each other, and it works. Even though Rhaenyra tried to apologize in episode 6, and that didn't work. And there was much less baggage back then. Perhaps if the show had additional episodes and a slower pace, these turnarounds would appear to make more sense. This isn't to say that the younger actors didn't do great work establishing friendship, or that the elder actors didn't do great work establishing a feud. But the moments of reconciliation, with both sets of actors, did not feel earned. Which is a bit of a shame, as Rhaenyra also is clearly supposed to represent politically liberal human beings, and Alicent is supposed to represent politically conservative human beings. Alicent is religious, traditionalist, while Rhaenyra is the feminist, bucker of tradition. And of course, currently, many are asking how to bridge the gap between liberals and conservatives, and the show's answer is simply apologize and compliment each other on the raising of kids and care for the elderly. Of course, friendship and the feud are not the only narrative aspects of these characters over the 10 episodes. And I will say, some things work despite the rushed pace, and some things do not. On the things that work, Alicent's growth from being Viserys' private advisor to essentially ruling the kingdom is a logical progression, as is Rhaenyra's growth from wanting to recklessly jump into war to being like her father and proceeding with caution. But then there's the things that didn't work. Rhaenyra, after claiming she doesn't want kids, at some point decides she wants to become the mother of six with no explanation. She has a 10-year relationship with Harwin Strong, a man she never showed any interest in before, and she has three children with him. Now, of course, these events are understandable with a 10-year time skip, but some narrative hint of potential changes would be nice. Meanwhile, other events appear rather unrealistic when there isn't any explanation or foreshadowing given. Would Rhaenyra really allow Kristen Cole, who murdered her husband's lover, to train her children? Would Alicent, who is established as a bona fide religious woman, really want to force her children into incestuous arranged marriages and forego alliances? Why? Would Alicent really allow a man who murdered his own family to masturbate to her feet in exchange for... gossip? Would Rhaenyra, who spared a deer once, really be the type of person to murder an innocent man for some political advantage? An advantage that, by the way, is completely illogical? Or would she put her children through the loss of a parent after she herself lost one? It's not that one cannot come up with reasons for why these events could occur, but narratively, one should explain them. Imagine between seasons, Chandler divorced Monica and married Phoebe, and then it was never explained. Yes, people get divorced and remarried all the time, but such a direction wouldn't work as one, characters were established one way, and so a change needs to show why it happened. And two, when a change is significant, other characters are affected and talk about the change. Far, far too often, Alicent and Rhaenyra are brought to points that simply do not make sense. They act illogically and the characters around them act illogically, simply to make a plot point happen. I mean, Rhaenyra makes it look like she murdered her husband specifically because she wanted to scare Alicent, and in the very next episode, Alicent reconciles with Rhaenyra and goes on a path of wanting to save her life. Again, it's not that the actors don't do their best to sell the scenes and create an atmosphere of real human emotion. They do. But there's only so much an actor can do to explain away pure and utter chaos. And that is what one really finds when one examines Rhaenyra, Alicent, and their relationship. It's pure and utter chaos. Anyway, moving on to our next story, Viserys, a wound that will never heal. Next, we meet Viserys. Now, of course, Viserys is the king, father of Rhaenyra, husband of Alicent. And while his decisions affect the princess and the queen greatly, he is surprisingly not that emotionally central to their stories. Not that the women don't love or care about the king, they do, but Alicent and Rhaenyra's stories focus much more on each other and their own paths than on Viserys. Put another way, Viserys is more of a supporting character for Alicent and Rhaenyra, then Alicent and Rhaenyra are supporting characters for him. 
especially in the later episodes. But this isn't to say that Viserys doesn't have his own story. He does. And it's actually a bit surprising to think about Viserys' story. He is a man who feels like he's in isolation. And so let's look at his story in isolation. So Viserys begins as a seemingly jovial man who does not deal with the stresses of rule well. He seems to have three small problems in life and one large one. The small problems are the war on the Stepstones, his chaotic brother, and his chaotic daughter. His big problem is the birth of his heir. Now Viserys plays down his problems in the small council scene, but we next find that Viserys has a wound that will not heal, and the maester specifically tells us that the stress in his mind is manifesting in his body. This is followed up with Viserys meeting Emma Arryn, and we already know that Emma is not well from her scene with Rhaenyra. We are reminded of her condition with the tepid bath and her exhausted nature, and she tells us that she has had birth complications in the past, and this is her final ordeal. Viserys speaks of being sure he will have a boy because of his dream, but we know at least subconsciously he is very worried. And going forward, things do not go well. Viserys kicks off the tourney while Emma is in labor, and the maesters tell Viserys that the baby needs to come out via cesarean, killing Emma. Viserys agrees. Against Emma's will, they cut her open, killing her, but the child dies anyway. And we get this shot of Emma's ring, which is later a symbol for her. Viserys is devastated, and then is asked to switch his heir to Rhaenyra, but he doesn't want to deal with the situation. Alicent is sent to comfort Viserys, interrupting him as he looks at Emma's ring, and then Viserys is told of the heir for a day incident. Viserys confronts Daemon and switches his heir, and orders Daemon away, though he cuts his fingers in the process, creating another wound. Viserys then tells Rhaenyra of the prophecy. In the next episode, problems grow as the situation in the Stepstones worsens, Alicent continues to visit Viserys as his diorama also grows. Alicent asks if Valyria can ever be restored, and Viserys says no and breaks a dragon. A new marriage to Lena Valarian is proposed to help with the situation in the Stepstones, and Viserys consults the Maester and Otto as his wounds are being treated. The new marriage is specifically called a replacement of Emma. Viserys meets with Lena, but seems to not like her because she's too young, and Alicent tries to please Viserys by mending his dragon. The problem with Daemon has also grown, as he's stolen Viserys' dead child's egg and declared himself heir. Viserys ponders Alicent by looking at the mended dragon, and then asks for Lionel's advice, who thinks Lena is a good match. Rhaenyra successfully deals with Daemon, and Rhaenyra and Viserys discuss Viserys remarrying. Viserys says that Emma can never be replaced, and that she is a wound that will not heal. The show is blunt. Rhaenyra seems okay with Viserys remarrying, but then it's revealed that his new wife is Alicent. Years pass, and Viserys' wounds have not healed. He has lost two fingers. The stepstones still linger, and Viserys is pressured to switch his heir to Aegon with a white heart scheme, though he seems more upset that Rhaenyra will not marry. He vents to Alicent about the pain of Emma and the prophecy, and later on, Alicent doesn't give advice on the heir status, but does give advice on the three lesser problems. She recommends letting Rhaenyra choose her husband, and to give aid to Daemon in the Stepstones. Alicent tries to mend things. In the end, Viserys does not switch his heir, and swears to Rhaenyra on Emma's memory that she will not be supplanted. Viserys becomes rather angry that Rhaenyra fails to find a husband, but is relieved that the Stepstones are conquered and his brother has returned though he fails to give Alicent any credit on that front. Things fall apart rapidly, though, when Daemon is seen out with Rhaenyra. He orders Daemon away again and commands Rhaenyra to marry Laenor Valarian while telling her more of the prophecy. Viserys is now overwhelmed by stress and illness as he goes to broker the marriage between Laenor and Rhaenyra. We find his illness is getting worse as his entire arm is being treated. Viserys begins the wedding feast feeling well, speaking of creating a new Valyria, but the return of his brother and the stress of the wedding falling apart causes him to collapse. After the 10-year time jump, we see that Viserys' diorama has exploded in size, his body has decayed even more, and he is completely resistant to talk of Rhaenyra's children being bastards. Viserys tries to pass the stresses of ruling to others, the Stepstones is still a problem, but now the rift between Alicent and Rhaenyra is an inescapable problem. Rhaenyra pushes for a marriage pact, but Alicent refuses. Lionel tries to quit, but is refused, and as Rhaenyra flees for Dragonstone, Viserys kisses the ring of Emma Arryn. At Lena's funeral, Viserys attempts to reconnect with Daemon, inviting him back to court, but Daemon refuses, 
On the way to bed, he mistakenly calls Alicent Emma. After Aemond loses an eye and Alicent cuts Rhaenyra, he screams for the rift to end and orders everyone to never speak of Rhaenyra's children being bastards again. We then see Viserys after one last time jump. He is bedridden, has lost an eye, has wounds all over his body, and now wears the mask of a broken man. He meets his grandchildren and unknowingly predicts the future, saying that Viserys is the name of a king, and then Rhaenyra wants to know if the prophecy is true and begs for her father's help. The next day, Viserys wants to have supper with the whole of his family, and Viserys makes it out of bed to the throne with Daemon helping him in tacit reconciliation, and Viserys declares that Luke is heir to Driftmark. While at dinner, he begs his family to come together as he loves them all, and the speech does seem to work on Alicent and Rhaenyra. He leaves, is in bed, and mistakes Alicent for Rhaenyra, speaking of the prophecy, and Alicent misunderstands him, and then he dies, with his last words being, my love. And so the Viserys story, in my opinion, is by far the best story that House of the Dragon tells. Head and shoulders. It's a tragic tale of a man feeling guilty over the loss of his wife and how he never gets over it, it being a wound that doesn't heal. But what really makes the Viserys story excel is that it's not just a story about a sad sack who misses his wife. It's about what that wound does everywhere. Emma Aaron and all she represents manifests in so many other places. First of all, when we examine Viserys' love life, we can see his attempt to replace Emma and heal with Alicent, represented by Alicent mending the dragon and her early attempts to mend the problems in his life, Rhaenyra, Daemon, the Stepstones. But we know that Alicent fails to do this. Though often well-intentioned at times, Alicent is never held in the same regard as Emma, and eventually she starts creating more problems than she mends. And then we can see that on a second level, Emma and the death of their son is the root cause for the many other problems in Viserys' life. It is the reason why he and Daemon feuded. It's why Rhaenyra has tension with him and why she cannot be free to live the life she wants. And according to Corlys, it's why foreign powers are so bold to test Westeros. And then on a third level, Emma and the other problems that do not heal mentally give Viserys stress and manifest as wounds that do not heal physically. Not that the maesters might not be actually poisoning him secretly, they might, but the point is, thematically, it is clear that the mental wounds that do not heal create physical wounds that do not heal. And then on a fourth level, Emma's death is the wound that will not heal for House Targaryen and a new Valyria, which Viserys wanted and obsessed over. Of course, had Emma's son lived, there would be no succession dispute. But it goes a bit further. Had Viserys never pressured Emma to have a son and simply had faith in Rhaenyra to start, naming her as heir, from the beginning, Emma wouldn't have died and Viserys would not have remarried. Emma Arryn is no less than a second doom of Valyria, bringing about the death of dragons. A parallel made when Alicent asked if Valyria could be restored. The answer is no, the wound cannot heal. And then on a fifth level, Emma's death is the wound that will not heal for the realm and their ability to be united and fight the White Walkers. With the death of dragons and Westeros falling into war after war after war, they are simply less equipped to deal with the prophecy. And then on a sixth level, I know this keeps going, we get this parallel to Lord of the Rings, where the concept of the wound that never heals is taken from. In Lord of the Rings, Frodo is stabbed by a Nazgul and Shelob and loses a finger and is forever separated from the One Ring. Physically and emotionally, he has wounds that never heal, leading him to depart for Valinor, which is metaphorically heaven or death. Viserys as well, with his wounds, losing fingers, physically and emotionally crippled, obsessing over Emma, embodied in a ring. And then he finally makes his journey to the afterlife. And then on a seventh friggin' level, Emma Aaron's death parallels Game of Thrones, where the death of an Aaron kicks off the action. And then, should I do one more? Okay, let's do an eighth one. Emma Aaron's death makes the overall theme of the show better. It couples with the patriarchy theme better than the whole prophecy dagger mumbo jumbo. The mistreatment of Emma causes a wave of systemic damage to the characters that last generations, just as the mistreatment of women in society creates waves of systemic damage that last generations. The whole Viserys story is so wonderfully sad, layered, and complex. And my favorite part of the story is actually, at the end, Viserys sees nearly all of the small problems of his life solved for a moment before his eyes. That is, he sees Rhaenyra happy, 
He and his brother are reconciled, his family is together, the House of the Dragon looks strong. And it all still doesn't matter because the real wound is Emma. All of the other wounds in his life could be mended, and for a brief moment they were. But not Emma. Never Emma. I could probably go on longer, but I just wanted to say it's an excellent, excellent job on the Viserys story. It's almost hard to believe that this is the very same show that had a butt fart into the camera. And I have many other themes and stories in House of the Dragon to discuss, but we'll have to wait until part two. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.